Okay, we're live. So thanks for tuning in. This is the workshop, Introduction to Machine Learning with Jax. And the focus of this workshop is to actually dive pretty deep into your workings of a basic machine learning model and seeing how this library called Jax allows us to write pretty fancy, sophisticated models with like fairly large amounts of ease because its API is basically the same as NumPy. So the broad promise of JAX is if you know NumPy, you already know JAX. So before, so before we get started, just a little bit about myself. I'm Erham and I don't really have a lot to say here other than that I am a pretty darky, somewhat eclectic undergrad my interests span across several different fields like from biology, machine learning, complex systems. And the, and yeah, I'm just really excited to, and this is my first time running one of these workshops. So please bear with me as I try to get things across. And I really hope everybody has a great time with this workshop today. So before we get started, um, would everybody just like mind going to the Slido and just mind quickly answering that have you used Jax before? Like a simple yes or no would be great. Um, you should be able to see the, the poll pop up on the Slido right about now. Mm. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm, I'll just take a minute or two. Responses are coming in. Mm. Okay, let's take another 30 seconds or so. Mm. Okay, let's take 15 or so seconds. Mm. Okay, so Okay, that seems pretty conclusive in that no one seems to have like used Jax before, at least in the people who responded. So that's interesting. And well, don't worry about it. By the end of this workshop, you will not only have used Jax, you'll have used Jax to build like an actual model to actually fit to some data. So why Jax? This workshop will be focused in either way, I would say there's like three components. The first is we're going to be looking at what JAX is and how it's so similar to NumPy and then builds on it and why it exists. We're then going to be focused on using JAX on some actual data to build out a basic linear model. We're then gonna have a Q&A at the end to answer any questions that you may still have or even answer more questions on like what you can, what are next steps you can do with Jax to learn even more. So yeah, you could, well, you could then ask why Jax, right? Because there's other libraries too. So why would you want to use Jax specifically? It's well, this Jax is already being used for really large real world things such as if you've heard of AlphaFold, which came out with the paper this summer, it was, JAX was used as part of the project to actually build out the model. JAX was used as a backend to something called the Haiku library, which in turn was used to actually build the protein folding models. JAX has also been used in other cases such as like physics simulations, such as these are things called rigid body simulations that you can use to simulate robots at like extremely fast speeds on a computer that previously would just have not been possible because these things now work at GPUs and TPUs at like thousands of times faster than they would ever run on a CPU. So JAX does a lot of things across a lot of different fields, but I also want to focus on what this workshop is about. And so this workshop is not really about two things. This is not a workshop about neural networks. Neural networks are really, really cool, but I really want to focus on the basics first, because again, the point of JAX is if you know how to build something from math, it's extremely easy to translate from the math into code. 
So if you can do it with simple models, you will be able to do it more complex models too. So I really want to focus on the simpler things on this one. This is also not a workshop about using an API or something like, say, using a already pre-trained computer vision model to classify objects. They're really cool, but that's not the focus here. This also means that this is not a workshop that you will likely be directly using for hackathon projects this time around. Because again, if you want to build something for hackathon, you're probably honestly better off using a pre-trained model via access via an API or something. The, the core of this workshop really is for your long term, longer term growth because both are important. Hackathons allow you to focus on things that are like a really short design sprints, right? But at the same time, this workshop exists to also help you focus on the longer term, learning how to build models essentially from scratch and understanding how to work the ground up. Both are equally important and this is focused on that longer term learning aspect. So, this is a basically a workshop about JAX. It's not a workshop about neural networks. It's not a workshop about the methods. It's a workshop about what JAX as a library is and how you can translate ideas into code so that you can actually use them in practice. So let's get started with the first section. The first section is what JAX looks like. And JAX's syntax is the way I would describe it. It's basically NumPy in a trench coat. What do I mean by that? Suppose you want to compute sine of x for like the first 10 integers. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, right? And you want to sum them together. What you do on the NumPy on the left is this. Create a range, one to 10, run sine on all of them, and then sum them together. What you do with JAX is, JAX has its own version of NumPy called JAX.NumPy. You import it as JNP. That's usually the standard convention to make sure you don't mix it up with the original NumPy. And then what, you create a range, run sign on it, and then add it all together. As you can see, there's like not only just a gigantic parallel between the two, they almost look identical to each other. And you can confirm that this actually works the way it should. Um, everybody should have access to this collab workbook that has been sent to the chat. Um, please make sure you have it open because we will be referring it to it quite constantly throughout the whole thing. And yeah, let's see. If you run this, hold on, bear with me a minute. I was just starting it up from scratch. Uh, hold on, it's connecting. Yep. So yeah, if you run this code, then the sum of x is 1.41. Done the same thing. And you can see it's 1.41. You can see that Jax is giving you this nice little warning. It says no GPU, GPU found on falling back to CPU. And we'll get that to that in a second. But yeah, you can see that the answers are identical. And the code also looks almost identical across both. And that's pretty intentional. That's a pretty intentional design aspect of Jax. So running back, JAX is NumPy, which means it's really straightforward to translate ideas that you have as math into code. So you might have this function on the left that looks like this. And I don't want you to compute this by hand. As was mentioned in the hack pack, I don't, the, none, nothing in this workshop requires you to compute anything by hand. The whole point is that computers are better at math than humans are. So let's put all the math onto the computers as much as possible. And you can see like a function in math can be easily translated to function in code. So why JAX then? JAX builds on NumPy with these things called function transforms that allow you to take functions, math functions that you already wrote and transform them to get all kinds of brand new nifty features so that they're doing newer tricks essentially. The first one we'll be looking at is a transform called JIT. JIT, which stands for just-in-time compilation. You don't really need to know the specifics of what a compilation is this time around, although you're more than happy to look at it later. But the core idea here is you, send a function to JIT and tell us that, hey, could you like take a look at this function and split it up for me? Again, getting back to the workbook. 
yeah, you see that we define this function as previously like one by one over e to the power of negative x. This function has the name of the logistic function. And you can see that, yeah. So let's look at JIT. JIT, you can access by using jacks.jit. And what's going on here? So this is a standard function in that what? It takes in a number, returns a number. JIT is what we call a higher order function. So logistic, the other one we defined earlier, this is a standard function, takes in a number, returns a number. JIT as a higher order function takes in a function and returns a function. So JIT takes in the, this logistic function that we defined earlier and returns another function that we're calling JIT logistic. So why would you want to run this transform? Because look that the outputs for both of these functions are the same. This original function and the transform version have the same outputs or the same inputs. The difference is if you were to run, if you were to like time both of these, the jitted version is a lot faster, almost four times as fast. The original one takes around 16 microseconds while the this jitted version only takes around four and a half microseconds to complete. What's going on here? When we're writing functions like this, especially in, we look at that, we're looking at multiple operations here. We have this one and then we're dividing by another thing. Then we're adding by another thing and then we're running an exponential on another thing. These are like individual processes that this function has to go through, like broken down. What JIT is, it tells Jack that, hey, this is doing a lot of operations. Can you look at this and fuse it together into just one thing? And Jack, Jax does that for you. You don't have to do anything else. You just be like, I want you to fuse this function into one really fast thing. Then you just pass it into JIT and just Jax does that for you. And this is a pretty simple function. It's just taking one scalar input and returning one scalar output. With machine learning, you're often working with like thousands of inputs over functions that are like gigantic matrices and vectors. So you can quickly see how useful JIT becomes in that it's taking these very complex operations and fusing them together into something that's extremely fast, which is really important when you're training neural networks because otherwise they would take quite a long time to actually even just finish a running. JIT makes it so that they actually run on practical time scales so that they're actually fast and easier to train. So yeah, returning back to JIT, what is it doing again? Like it's it takes in a function and then returns another function. So again, functions and function transformations in JAX are functions that have a function as input, function as output, function in, function out. The second transform we're looking at requires a bit of a detour through derivatives. And again, as mentioned in the hackback, we don't expect you to know how to compute a derivative by hand. As they, again, the promise of this workshop is no computing anything by hand here. So, so basic, so, from an elementary understanding of derivatives is that you may be familiar with that. Uh, so suppose we have the function x squared here, then f of two, which is the value of this function at two is four because that's two squared, that's four. And the derivative of x squared is two x. There's no need to know how to compute it. Just know that the derivative of x squared is two x, which two x is two times two, that's also four. And derivatives are commonly visualized as a slope at a given point. But another interpretation, the one that's going to be more useful for this workshop is to look at them as almost like a direction that at f of one, this is equal to one. The derivative at one is equal to two, this two x, two times one equals to two. And instead of visualizing it as a slope, I wanted to visualize it as an arrow. Since this is two, this is an arrow of length two, and since this is positive, it's pointing this way. Similarly, if we were doing it here at minus one, this would be a vector that points like with the length of two that, that way to the left since it's negative. So I want you to focus on derivatives as like starting at the point and then basically being an arrow to the right or to the left of the x-axis. We'll get that to y in a very quick second. So why do we care about derivatives? Because a lot of machine learning problems uh, boil down into, hey, we have this thing here that measures how bad our model is. So 
which is usually called an error function or a loss function, depending on what context you're looking at. Loss function is usually the common term. And if we have a way of measuring how bad our model is, we can try minimizing how bad our model is. So we might be starting off here and we're like, okay, so we're here and the model's pretty bad. How about we try moving the model's values, the parameters of the model as we'll see in a bit to here where the loss function is smaller. How do we minimize the loss? And that's where derivatives as we learn are super useful because of something called gradient descent. How do we minimize functions? It's to use something gradient descent. So returning back to this function, suppose we start you off at four. How do you find the minimum here? Now you could be like, well, this is x squared. It's dead obvious that the minimum here is zero, right? Because x, x squared times zero is equal to zero. Everything else is a positive value. But for a moment, pretend that this isn't x squared. This is like some really, really complicated neural network function, which you don't have an exact answer to to find the minimum. What we want to find is a general strategy that works to find the minimum for a function, no matter what the actual function you're given is. It should be a general strategy. And that's what gradient descent is. Gradient descent basically tells you that we start off. So let's say we start off at four. That's like with gradient descent, you do two steps. One is you make a guess. It could be anything. Some guesses are better than others, but for now we can just say that, hey, let's pretend our minimum is X is equal to four. That is not the minimum here because X is equal to four times four, that's 16. For the function X squared, F of four is equal to 16. That is clearly not the minimum you can tell, but like we can pretend that is the minimum. What you then do is you take this minimum value and then subtract the derivative times a constant from that value to get a new guess. And you keep doing this over and over again to make better and better guesses. Visually, this process looks like this. You start off at this guess point, x is equal to four, as you can see, x is equal to four. You compute the derivative at that point. You multiply with some small number. We're Here we're using 0.25. And then you subtract it from the guess. So four minus two, that is two. Then you compute this whole term again, two, like, so two minus one, that would be one. And so what happens, like remember the original arrow form that we used a couple of minutes ago, the, the arrow was pointing this way. So if you subtract it, it starts pointing this way and only a quarter length, and we're cutting it down to the length of a quarter. So it's pointing this way with only the quarter of the length it originally had. And then we go down to the x value. We compute that derivative again, flip the sign, and then compute the length again, go down again. And we keep doing this process repeatedly. And as a result of that, what we get is the minimum value of the function eventually as we keep making better and better guesses. So we'll be looking that in a code in a real short bit, but. So if we have the way to compute the derivative, we can minimize any function because this is a strategy that works for any function. We don't really care what the actual nature of x squared is. We just said that if we have access to this derivative, we can compute its minimum. And so how do you compute, go around computing this derivative? You could do it by hand, like the way we translated this, this logistic function earlier. You, you could also like take x squared and you could also compute it out its derivative by hand and then translate both into code, but that's a little tedious. And as you get more and more complex functions, it's going to be really annoying. That's where Jack's second function transformation comes in. You define a function and then you just run jacks.grad on it. That grad stands for gradient. And you might be like, what's the gradient? Um, for the purpose of this workshop, you can just pretend that gradient is like a way to get the derivatives from multiple values at the same time. As we'll see in the next section, which has two inputs, this only has one input. So the gradient is the derivative, but the gradient is a way of saying that I want the derivatives for all my input, for all my parameters at the same time. This thing only has one parameter. So it's the gradient for, so it's only the derivative for this one parameter. So yeah. If we say f of two is this thing, then the gradient of f at two is this, which is again, just the derivative. 
So let's look at that process we just described in practice. We define this function. We run the square of it. That, well, the square of one is one, makes sense. And we run this gradient function. And just as we mentioned before, that like, yeah, the, the derivative of one should be two. And the derivative of one is two, as we see here. It's a good sanity check that this thing is working. So let's look at the gradient process, like gradient descent process. What do we have here? We start off with an initial guess at four, x equals to four. And then we also set this thing called a step size, which is this 0.25 thing we mentioned here. So let's print, let's just make a guess. So our guess for the minimum value of f is x is equal to four, which results in f of x is 16, which is again, not the correct answer. But the idea is that we can make that guess better over time because we do this process repeatedly. We take the guess, we take the derivative of f at that point and then multiply it with this step size and then keep making that guess again. And you can see that our guess increasingly approaches zero. Like we have four, then our new guess is two, then a new guess is one, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 1.25. And it keeps getting really close to zero. Like it's, a ten, it's almost a 10 to the power of like negative zero, negative six, which is like a really small number. So this is a process is often described as something called hill climbing which does make sense because the way you can imagine this is this entire landscape is like you're on a, you're limited to moving only on one dimension and you're at the top of a hill here and you want to very quickly get to the bottom of the hill. So the way you do it is you find the direction of increase. You're like, if I move forward, like if I feel the ground in front of me, it's going up, which means I want to go backwards, right? And you take a backward step and then you go here and you're like, well, the ground still feels like it's like increasing in front of me. So I go back again and then I go back again. And then you keep doing this until the ground feels like it's level at that which point you stop moving. And that's basically what's happening here that the gradient tells you which way the ground goes up. You know that if the ground is going up in the positive x direction, you just go up in the negative x direction. And same here, if you were to start off here, the ground would go up in the negative x direction because the derivative is like this, right? So you'd be like, okay, ground goes up in the negative x direction, so move towards the positive x direction. And you keep doing this. You might be like, so why do we need this step size thing? Why can't we just be like, have just this, right? Hold on. Why can't we just have this affect the gradient? Because it leads to this situation. Oh, hold on, I need to reset this value, whoops. Yeah, why can't we just directly subtract like this gradient value? It's because it leads to this rather hilarious ping pong situation here. What does it mean? So if you're starting off four, then if you use the full length, that's minus eight. So four minus eight is minus four. Here, the value is eight. So minus four plus eight is four. It's like if you're starting off on a hill and you're like, okay, the hill goes up this way, I'm gonna go down. But instead of taking a small step, you go so far that you end up on a different hill instead. And then you're not this other side of a, like you've crossed the value over into a different hill and you're like, okay, this is the wrong place. So you're like, okay, the ground goes up in a negative x direction. So I'm gonna move to the positive x. And then you take such a large step that you're back on that original hill again. And you keep ping ponging between those two hills. To, for gradient descent to work, you have to keep taking small steps so you don't go so far as to shoot your overshoot your minimum and end up on a different hill instead. That's why we usually use a small constant. 0.25 is considered pretty large in most machine learning contexts. Most the one you commonly see is around like 0 0.0001 or like like one 10 to the power of negative three or 10 to the power of negative four. So that you keep taking really small steps to make sure that you're actually heading towards the minimum and not like going so far as to cross the minimum over entirely. So this turns out to work. You can just ask Jax politely to do that. Hey, could you just come to the derivative here? And that's the whole idea. You could just be like, Jax, could you like do my, can you just find the gradient here? You could, 
technically use Jax to do your calculus homework, although I don't recommend that. But the idea is that you take a function and then you run it through the gradient grad transformation and then it returns another function, which is a function that computes the derivative of f at a point of your choice. But here's where Jax gets really cool. Uh, hold on. So yeah, just to summarize again, that gradient descent is a general strategy that could be used to minimize any function. To create a new guess, you take the original guess, you the current guess you have, and then subtract the gradient of f. This, this reverse delta thing basically means the gradient of f times this small gamma thing, which just means the step size. Again, this crazy looking line of math is not just similar to, but exactly the same as this line of code here. These two are not similar. They are identical, just written out differently. So Jackson is cool in that you can actually compose transforms together. Suppose you have a function. So now we have a way of computing our gradient. But also, what if you want to like make it more efficient the way JIT does? Well, you can just JIT the gradient. As you can see here, so we know that the gradient, so we could just run, like just run JIT over the gradient here. And it creates, and not only does it create a function that creates, computes your derivative, it creates a function that computes the derivative and then optimizes that new function all at the same time. And you can see that it, so here it returns 0.3 and we can compute, we can just quickly verify that this is the same as what the regular gradient function would return. Be like this. Both have the same output, except this is going to be a lot faster than this one. So that's the first half of this workshop. Just a quick rundown of how Jax works. And moving on, we want to get a bit more about like a bit more machine learning -y here. So right before we head to there, there's no that we cover two transforms here. One is the JIT transform, the other is the gradient transform. The other, there are two other transforms that we won't have time to cover today, but you're more, but you really should look them up later. One is called VMAP, which instead, like we here, like say we're computing the gradient of like this one number, right? VMAP allows you to compute the gradient for a bunch of inputs all at the same time. So instead of say processing one image through a neural network, you can pro you get a function that processes a hundred inputs through a hundred images through a neural network at the same time. PMAP is a similar thing, except instead of doing it on one computer, it does it across when you say have like a large multi-GPU or multi-GPU setup. Both of these are basically for parallelism across multiple inputs when you need it. Um, but yeah, we won't be really focusing on those today, but you really should look them up later if you're interested more about them. So yeah, first, okay, let's all this introduction to Jack's aside, let's just try to get our hands dirty and just make a model. But before we proceed, does anyone have any questions? Like if we could drop them into the Slido, that would be really nice. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions? Like just drop them into the Slido. I'll take a minute here just to breathe essentially. Mm. Yeah, if you have any questions, do drop them into the Slido and not the hop in because the Slido is the one that's being actively moderated right now. Mm. Okay, let's see. Mm. Okay, no questions so far. I'm assuming all of you are following along, then that's nice. We will have time for a much more proper Q&A at the end of this though, so please rest assured. So now that we have a decent-ish understanding of how Jax works, let's focus on making a model. So what is machine learning at the end of the day? Um, the way I would answer it is parameter estimation, really fancy parameter estimation. 
the idea behind machine learning is that there are some parameters that produce the data you see. For example, um, as we'll see really shortly, we might you might collect some data on how many pop songs you're listening to on a daily basis and that may be generated by some some parameters that interact with like the inputs of your model so the inputs may be say how much time you're spending studying and those interact with the parameters to produce the data you're seeing which is the output values that so so if you're saying that you, if you study for an hour a day, you listen to you like listen to twice the number of hours you study. Then the two is the parameter here. Like whatever is interacting with your input is the parameters. The question in machine learning is that we don't usually know these parameters beforehand. We just have access to the output values. So how can we estimate those parameters that are that interact with the data to produce the output? Sounds a little abstract, so let's make this really concrete. So, so suppose we have this scenario where if I study for X hours in a day, I listen to two X times three plus, sorry, two X plus three pop songs. This is mostly accurate as I would understand it because I do listen to a somewhat obnoxiously large amount of pop music. I've been listening to a lot of Kali Minow lately. Strong recommendation. <laughs> but that aside, um, yeah. You don't know. So here's the thing. I'm giving you this answer here that the actual number of songs I listen to is y equals to 2x plus 3. But suppose you don't know this. And this is true in general. Like you don't know the actual thing that's generating this. You don't know the actual equation for the data, right? You just know, you just collect some data. You don't know this true process. So you just observe me for say 20 different days and then see how many times, how much time I spent studying that day and how many pop songs I listened to during that day. And you see that there, this data seems to be forming a line. So you're like, you want to create a model and you say, and since you don't know the actual values of like two and three here, you're just like, okay, let's call these A and B and we have some data. So the question then becomes, how can you estimate A and B from the data you have? Again, like two X plus three generates this data. Two and three are the parameters. They generate the output values of the number of songs. I'm, like take the input of how many hours I studied and create the output of how much, how many pop songs I listened to. The question in machine learning is given the output data, pairs of information about how many hours I studied and how many pop songs I listened to, how can you guess the original parameters two and three from just like, how can you go from data to parameters? So you can just say that, okay, we don't know the actual values, but we can just set them to A and B. And remember earlier how we optimizing, like finding the minimum of the X squared function, we just said, okay, let's just say the minimum is X equals to four. We can just be like, okay, we can just pretend A is equal to one, B is equal to zero. These are probably not the correct values, but these are places that data started. Now you can see that the line that's generated by A is equal to one and B equals to zero is very far off from the actual guess. It doesn't seem to line up with the data we have. It's clearly wrong, but we can find a way of quantifying how bad our guess is, how bad our line is. And a common one that's used for something like this is something called, is basically taking the square of the distances, uh, taking the square of like our guessed values and the actual values. So these red bars, they correspond to the distance between like the actual guess here and the, and the value of the line there. So the goal, uh, so the goal here would then be to shift the line so that it lines up with the blue data points as close as possible, which means that the goal is to make sure that these red distances that are like these values here, this individual red distances are each of these values and then we sum them and average them together are as small as possible. Like this error, is as tiny as possible so that the line actually just goes through all these data points. And well, now we have a way of, now that we have a way of quantifying how bad our model is, we can do the same thing we did earlier, which is optimize this. Going back to the code book. Yeah, we have some data 
let's see. Yep. That's a two is equal to three. Yeah. So let's import plot my plot lib. Also, hold on, made a mistake here. That's actually 20 data points. 500 is way too many. Oops. So let's create the two, the true parameters here are A is equal to two, B is equal to three. And then we have this function that this says that let's multiply A of X plus B. And let's create some data. We can only do this because we have access to like the actual parameters of the system. Normally, you don't have access to the actual parameters of the system, so you can't create the data. You have to collect it from the outside world and then run the estimation process backwards. You can't create the data because you don't know what the actual parameters are. Here, we're pretending we know, so that's helpful. So we have on the x-axis the hours we studied, y-axis we have. We just sample at some random points x, and then we compute the values of y for each of those points within the true parameters. And then we have this error. What is the error function made of? It's basically saying that make a prediction of what y is at that point, which again is the values on this line, right? So since we're starting with a equals to one and b equals to zero, it's literally just, oh, sorry, oops. Mm. So yeah, we just, okay. Ooh. Okay. So we just have a quantification of how bad our guess is. Because, so we just have a quantification of how bad our guess is because we then like guess it using the, the parameters we have and then compare it with the true values. We score the difference and then we take the mean. This is the way we quantify how bad our guess is for a given set of parameters. And then we can just compute this gradient jit over it. And then that way we have a way of computing the, gr the gradient for each of the a derivative for each of the values of A and B for a given value of the error. We'll see that shortly what that means in practice. But yeah, let's start off with guessing that our values are A is equal to one, B is equal to zero. And what happens? So, as you can see, um, just to make sure that I understood it right. Yeah, so you can see that the red line is, uh, so the red line is the true values. This blue line represents our guesses. So for each value of X, we are guessing, we're just guessing a value of Y. And you can see that they're pretty far off. Like these values are not lining up with these values here. They're all very far off because these values of A and B are not correct. A is equal to one, B equals to zero. Well, in practice, they're actually A is equal to two and B is equal to three. And we can actually get, compute how bad this error is. We do run this. Oh, what happened? Oh, I didn't run this cell, whoops. So yeah, we have this guest parameters, X, which is the inputs, and Y, which is like the collected data we have. And we can we get this value back, which is 51. The actual value doesn't really have a physical interpretation to speak of. It's not terribly relevant. What we really care about is that this number tells us how bad our guess is, because like it's a difference between these distances, these distances, these distances. Like ideally we want, if our parameter values were correct for any value of X, it would return the correct value of Y, right? And not this weird far off guess. If we had the value of say 1.25, it would correctly return this value here, this value here and so forth, not these wrong guesses. So what we can do is that we have these guessed values of the parameters and we can optimize them. So we have a way of guessing the error here and we can take the gradient. And this tells us exactly how much we need to adjust both values of A and B. Here, we're being told that if you decrease the value of A, your error will go up. Because remember, the derivative tells you the fastest direction of increase, which means if you go in the direction that gradient is telling you, your error is going to go up. You want to do the reverse. So here it tells us that if we decrease the value of A, the error will go up, which makes sense because A here is one. The actual value of A is two, 
which means if we decrease the value, we go even further away from two and the error should go up. And it all, the reverse also means true. If you increase the value of A, if you increase the value of A, then the value, then the error will go down. So error tells you how bad your guess is. The gradient of the error tells you how you need to adjust each of your parameters to compensate for, to like decrease that error. And very similar to that process we did here earlier, we do this now, is that we take the gradient and then adjust each of these, multiplied by a small step size. The step size you can see here is 0 0.01 times the A times B. So let's just run this process. And as you can see, this is pretty quick. Like, let, let, let me try running that again by like, let's just reset the values of the guess. And you don't really even have a time to blink here. That's because the JIT gradient function is so fast that you just don't have time to blink. It runs, confuse them insanely fast. And what's going on here is it runs this iterative process of taking small steps for each of A and B and updates them over time. So you can see that uh, at step zero, these guesses, so yeah, as, hmm, hold on there. As you can see after the, already after the first step, we've already increased the value of from one to 1 1.6 and from B from zero to 0 0.14. And then this process keeps repeating itself over and over until we very quickly get to the correct value almost to the correct values of A and B here. B A should be two and B should be equal to three. Now let's run it for a little longer like this. And as you can see, when we run it for a long amount of time, it gets pretty close to the correct values. A is almost very close to zero, two, B is very close to three. Of course, the only reason we were able to get these good values is because we have a perfect guess like we collected our data really well. There wasn't any noise in it. It's a really good guess. Problem is, suppose that I am not very good at keeping track of time. Frankly, I'm not. <laughs> so instead of giving you the correct values of Y, I give you the value of Y shifted by a little bit. Like it's a little noisy. So you see this perfect linear plot here? Well, it ends up being a bit more like, it's a bit more messy than that. Some of these things are off the line because I'm giving you times that are slightly off from the actual ones. So you do this process again. And you can see like, this is the data we have. This is the data we're getting if we would like directly predict each value of Y from like our current guessed values of A and B. And then you get the error again. Compete. The grain looks like this. And you run this optimization process with these new guesses. And again, just to clarify, the guesses have been reset. So get this. And you run this all over again. As you can see, the guesses are not as clean this time around. A is not that perfectly close to 2. It's actually closer to 2.01. And B is a lot more far off here. It's not 2.99 here. It's 2.93. What's going on here? The thing is when you have noisy data, there may be other lines, other lines that fit to this noisy data better than your original data. That's simply because your data has been corrupted a little, which means the original values may not be the best values for this corrupted data. Something else nearby might actually fit this corrupted data better than your original one. And that's the thing to keep in mind with any machine learning model. It's that any real world data you collect will have some noise in it, which means that the perfectly recovering the parameters that produce the data just doesn't, isn't possible. You're going to get a very good estimate of it, but that's all what it is, an estimate. So yeah, we built a very basic model that computes this linear model. Okay. So yeah. For the record, the line here actually corresponds to A equals to zero, B is equal to one, in that it's a linear model as I realize that later. But that's also fine. You could have also started at this guess instead, A is equal to one, B. So A is equal to zero and B is equal to one. 
And you would have had a similar time, essentially. And we could actually do that right now. Right? We could say that our guess is A equal to zero, B is equal to one. And you can see that it's all of these points are on this flat line. Like it's just a different guess, or just a different starting point. And it's 109. So this guess is actually worse than like our previous initial guess. Again, it's fine to make any guess as long as it's like reasonably close to the original values. Oh, what happened here? Oh, whoops. So this is actually a really good reminder. Jackstrap gradient doesn't work when your values are integers. They have to be floating point numbers. This makes sense because like integers are like these discrete values. Floating points are continuous and you can only take gradients of things that are continuous. So, hold on, what happened? So yeah, get the error here. And yeah, your initial guesses this time are zero, one. You run this optimization process again. And even though we start from a different point, we end up at pretty similar guess values, which is 2.01, 2.93. So the actual guess doesn't really matter that much in the simple model. They, it does matter when you have more complex models. But again, as long as you're starting at reasonable values, your model should converge to values that are reasonable minimums of these functions. So let's extend on this scenario a little. Because any real world input is any real world data isn't gonna be just one input, right? It's probably gonna be two values, multiple values. So suppose I modify the real system. The real system now is suppose if I study for X one hours in a day and clean the room for like X two minutes in a day, I listen to twice the number of hours times 0 0.25 the number of minutes plus three pop songs. Again, you don't know this true process. So you collect some data. Now, when we say collect some data, in practice, this would actually mean going out and observing me for like multiple days and collecting some data. But here, since we know the true process, we can just pretend we just collected the data ourselves, right? We just say A1, A2, and then we just create some fake data on our on the fly. And yeah, so we just sample some random values of X and Y. We sample X from zero to six, sample X2 from zero. So like anywhere study time between zero to six hours, number of minutes spent cleaning from 0 to 30 minutes. And then we compute the values of the function there and add in some noise to simulate the fact that our collection process won't be perfect. This is what the data then ends up looking like. See, it's almost like forming this plane, except like it's a lot of the points are like jittering off the plane, which is again going to happen with any real data. They're not going to perfectly form, stay on a line or a plane. So we use these values of the parameters to produce this true data. And it's the same here, a1 times x, a2 times x, the second value of x, and then the parameter zero, b. And let's make a guess for, now we want to estimate these values from the data. We don't know, like, again, we don't know this. You don't know these values. You are not allowed to access these values. You don't know the true parameters. All you have access to are these, make a guess. So we can be like, okay, a1 equals to one, a2 equals to two, a2 also, sorry, a1. Yeah, so yeah, let's say that a1. So let's say that again, you create a new model, except it's this time it's a1, x1, a2, x2, and then b1, I'll say that's b. And then you just wish to estimate a, a1, a2, and b. Again, in the spirit of gradient design, you just choose some values. We can just say a1 is one, a2 is one, b is equal to zero. So, we do that exactly here. And same as last time, we just compute the gradient because like you can see this for yourself because the error is these params. Uh, hold on. I don't think we haven't. Yeah, we, don't, we need to run this first. So yeah, the error for these params x and y. Mm. Oh, whoops. <laughs> That's the thing with life coding. <laughs> Get a lot wrong, wrong a lot. So you can see that this error exists. And you can do the similarly again, like then compute the shift cat error, which is hmm. Yeah, you get a, you get values for each of these. So you're like, okay, A1. A2 and B, and it tells you how to change the values of these parameters. So here it's telling you that if you increase A1 
your error is going to go up. So you should decrease it and so on. And so we do this repeatedly for say 10,000 steps. We just print out our guess every 500 steps or so. And let's just run this process. And you can see, again, it very quickly converges to values that are close. You have like two for the first one, 0 0.25 for the second one, which again is what these values were, two, 0 0.25. The last one's a little off. It's not close to three even. But again, that's also because we started off with noisy data. So there may be other planes that fit this data better than our original values. Remember, these are estimates. That's all they'll ever be. But they are good estimates because you can see that these params guess are these values. And these params true, this 2.253. So why do we care about like getting these values right then? It's because let's return back to like the basic AX plus B model. It's so when we have these zero and one, um, oops, to redefine the model again. Yeah. Yeah. So when we have these zero and one, these values are off. But if we optimize these values, let's let's just say one second, five steps. Once we have these values perfectly lined up, then when we make our guesses, we can see that these guessed values are pretty close to the actual values once we've like estimated the parameters correctly. Once we have the correct values of A and B, we have access to the true line again. And that means that we could compute the values of this line for other points here. So suppose I want to find, so 3.75 isn't in the data here, but I could just be like F params guess, X could be, yeah, and X could just be like, I just want like the value of 3.75. And it just says that the value of that should be around like, I, so if you just say, once you have the equation for the line, you can then guess it for any new input value. 3.75 isn't in our originally collected data. You never saw me, saw what happens when I study for three and a half, three, three and a three point seven five hours and how many songs I listen to. But you can make a pretty good guess based on the line you fit, which would be around 10 and a half songs. Sounds about right. And that's true with models in general. Suppose you train a model to classify the different images of cats and dogs. You show it hundreds of images of cats and dogs. And it's learned to model that data, the, to guess the true parameters. So when you show it a new photo of a dog, it can guess based on the parameters it's already fitted for previous data and make a pretty good guess based on that. The principle is the same. You fit some data, so you fit parameters to some data, and then you try it out on a new input. And it should hopefully be similar. So yeah, wrapping this up, We did make an assumption here, which is that we assume that our true model was this thing. And in real world cases, that won't be the case. Think about it. Like it's, I don't decide how many songs I want to listen to based off, okay, I've studied for two hours now. So therefore I'm going to listen to a pop, pop song. It's probably like a much more complex mental process or it could be something much crazy. It could be like something like this function here, which could be like, okay, if I've studied for no time at all, I'll listen to four songs. If I stayed for an hour, I'll get exhausted. So I'll listen to no songs. If I said for two hours, I mean, like suddenly feeling very energetic against so I listen to four songs, three hours, no songs. It could be like this weird process. This, in this case, it's like a weird, like sinusoidal curve, like just goes up and down. So what if I try to fit a line here? It wouldn't work because I could, the line could like go here and then it could fit like, okay, as time goes on, my, my desire to listen to songs decreases and It'll, you'll fit a line here and then it'll hit negative values, which doesn't make sense anymore because how can I listen to a negative number of songs? Same here, you could fit it here and it just keeps going up and up, ignoring the nature of this data. The thing with processes is that your actual model needs to be able to fit the actual nature of the data. If your data isn't linear, then trying to fit a linear model will only approximate it at some points well and will fail everywhere else. 
This is also by the way why neural networks are so powerful because they can fit to a really, really large number of data types without make, making assumptions on whether it's linear or not. They can fit very complex nonlinear functions. But in general, if your model, the structure of your model cannot fit the data, you'll never have zero error, even if you perfectly ca ca collected the data, simply because it's incapable. A linear function cannot represent data that doesn't have a linear structure. So that's a lot, I suppose. And that's the true with any machine learning workshop in general, because there's multiple things you need to cover at the same time. You need to cover both how to code things and how to understand some new mathematical concepts at the same time. I'm not saying this was done perfectly either. But ultimately, I do want this to be a starting point that you look back on and feel free to look back at the collab workbook we gave you to see how the code actually works, play around with it and try new things with it. Ultimately, no workshop on machine learning within the span of an hour is going to be complete. It's going to require some practice on your end. I'm not saying that at the end of this workshop, you know how to build alpha fold. You don't, <laughs> neither do I. But the goal is that the principles for a lot of these machine learning models end up being the same. Gradient descent is still used at the heart of major machine learning models. Sure, the algorithm is more sophisticated that's used in practice, but the core ideas are the same. Define a loss function, then find a way to take steps to minimize that loss function. So again, in conclusion, machine learning is just math on computers. There's not that much magic here. It's a lot of math. But the power of JAX is it allows you to look at the math you're studying and seamlessly translate that into code with minimal overhead. You still need to learn the math at the end of the day. But the promise of JAX is it's not that much of a pain to convert that math into code once you know how the math works. So yeah, that's it mostly. I would like to point out some further resources from here. Firstly, what, as with any new libraries, you always read the documentation. JAX's documentation is pretty well written and I would absolutely recommend you read through that. Secondly, the mysterious gradient transformation tends to stump a lot of people because you're like, how does it work? If you want to learn how it works behind the hood, the process is called backpropagation. And this tutorial will let you know how, more about how gradients are computed by computers these days. And lastly, if you want to learn more about neural networks, you, 3B, 3B1 Brown, one of my favorite YouTube channels has like an entire video on that. And again, like the promise to me is the same. If you look at that video, you'll see some math and then you'll be able to directly code that math into JAX once you understand it. So that's a wrap for me. Um, we are a little over time, but we still have time for questions if any of you have any, and I'd be more than happy to answer them. So if you could just drop them in the slider, that would be great. Okay. So, is a gradient like a PID control? Oh, I love this question. So we do have some questions. Please keep dropping more questions. I'll be answering them. But there are two questions so far that I'd love to answer. Um, the first is, is the gradient like a PID controller? Um, PID controller for the rest of the audience who isn't familiar with robotics is like an iterative process to like majorly keep things around one value. And the gradient absolutely is like a PID controller. In fact, there is this really lovely post, uh, hold on. Let me quickly see if I can find it. Mm. Yeah, um, I just replied back on that the great, like PID, like there's this lovely post by Ben Recht, I think that's actually equates gradient descent to PID controller. So you really might want to take, take a look through that. But basically the idea is the same, that this is an iterative optimization procedure to keep things on track. Um, the other question is, how do we pick the type of model then? If I have tons of complex data, how do I know which functions can approximate it? That is a very good question. And the answer to that is, it takes some practice, essentially. You have to look at the nature of your data and need to make guesses of that. If you're looking at weather data, which has like, like varies in a, like in a, almost like in a sinusoidal way over like the year, like temperatures goes up during the summer, goes down during the winter, then goes back up. Then you might want to have a model which has like a sine or cosine curve built into it so that you can approximate that data. 
But, and that's very useful when you're working with like simple data. But when you have like really complex data, like say actual images, it actually is really hard to know in advance what type of models are going to approximate it. So what the approach right now is to use this gigantic neural networks to approximate, because these giant neural networks are capable of approximating any function. Like they're guaranteed by a theorem actually. But we basically make trade-offs here. If we want to use a simpler model, we can use it, but we run the risk of it not fitting the data. If we use a more complex model, it's going to likely fit the data, but we run the risk of not being able to interpret it as cleanly. Um, hope that answers the question. Um, anything else? Um... So, mm. Okay, so yeah. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you have any further questions, just a reminder that the Hackback also has my Discord and if you want, and of course my Twitter, which is of course my social media poison of choice is Ram Shafkat. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out at any time. And yeah, this has been Introduction to Machine Learning with Jax. Thanks for your time and hope you all have a great day and a great time with the Hackathon. <laughs>